So would you all arise one more time? Uh, we're going to proclaim the word of God. We will take turns. Now let me go first. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and telling the message only to Jews. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today we are celebrating the 48th anniversary of our church. First and foremost, I'd like to give glory and thanks to the Lord for His faithfulness of all those years. And I also would like to give thanks to Pastor Moon and all the pastors who have served our church with all their hearts. And of course, I'm so grateful for the church members, our ordained deacons, appointed deacons, and all the servants of this church for their hard work to serve the body of Christ. Um, and without you, um, you know, we would not have come to this far, that I know. Um, so I want to exhort you and your good works and encourage you uh, for your undivided hearts to serve this church. Thank you so much. Two years from now, we will be celebrating our 50th anniversary, and I believe that TFVC will just faithfully carry out its mission until the day the Lord comes. Amen? Amen. So from today's passage, we see uh, this church pleasing to God, and I really hope and pray that just like the church in Antioch, we'll continue to please our Lord. Amen? So I want to just share with you these three lessons, three takeaways from the church in Antioch. Number one, the Antioch church was a church that preached the gospel through the faith of martyrdom. How did the Antioch church come about? You know the story. The Antioch church was founded by believers who had dispersed from Jerusalem due to Stephen's martyrdom. In other words, people who had endured the trials and tribulations of the faith gathered together and established a church. And it's ironic that the people who have experienced the trials of the faith can actually enjoy the blessing of becoming poor in their spirit. I want you to think about that. Because all impurity stuff in their lives have melted away through their trials. And of course, some may have different experiences. Faith may be shaken and hearts filled with the anger, wounds, and bitterness, and so on. It could happen just like that. However, the Antioch church became so enthusiastic that they shared the gospel with the Gentiles, which never happened before. So that was a big step. That was a big move. When preaching the gospel, it doesn't matter whether we have a different skin colors, speak different languages, or have different cultures. It doesn't really matter. Amen. 
What matters is that God the Father is pleased when someone believes in Jesus Christ and is being saved. That's what matters the most. So the people in the Antioch church, they finally they realized that essence of the gospel, the core of the gospel. So they spread the gospel regardless of languages and skin colors, and that's how this church came about. That's the DNA of Antioch Church, and I see the same DNA from TFBC. Amen? Amen. God is pleased when the church stays focused on what matters to Him. In verse 21, it says, The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The Lord reaches out His hands to where He is pleased. Uh, When we eat Korean food... I don't know what kind of Korean food you like, but usually in Korean food menus, you see many side dishes coming along with the the main dish. So there are many side dishes on the table, right? And when I find my favorite side dish, my hand gets busy, (laughs) right? That happens. Same thing with the Lord. And we have to make his hands busy. Amen? Amen? We have to please him. And when he touches, when he reaches out his hands, the lost will be found. The sick will be healed. And the demons will be cast out. That's what's going to happen. As we focus on the core of the gospel, I believe that the Lord's almighty hands, his saving hands, will reach out to us, TFBC. Second point, the second lesson we learned from this church of Antioch, there was a servant of a God like Barnabas. Verse 24, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. The healthy church we long for is this kind of church. We have to long for the healthy church, not big church, not fat church, healthy church. In a church, the hand of the Lord is present, and godly workers filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit are being raised. That's what the healthy church looks like. When a good servant like Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, starts to serve in a church, many people around the region, they will come to the church. They come to the church, and we need more people like that in this TFBC. People like Barnabas. But the problem is, you know, in many cases, people want to be more like Paul. Apostle Paul is more attractive than, you know, Barnabas for many people. I think oftentimes that's where the problems come. We need more people like Barnabas. As we all know, uh, you know, there will be uh, this old deacons installation and also retirement service later this afternoon. If you look at Acts chapter 6, verse 3, there are three conditions for giving the office of deacon. Uh, he must be a man full of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, and good reputation. Good reputation. Have you ever seen a bad person being praised? Not likely, Right? To receive a praise from people, he or she must have a good character. Good character matters. He must have a good personality. No matter how smart or capable you are, if you are prideful and not humble, you will not receive praise from people or from God. That's the bottom line. When you look at the description of Barnabas in verse 24, it is quite similar to the seven deacons, seven deacons in the early church. Barnabas is a good person, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. He is well balanced in those uh, aspects. And when you look at these aspects, it's all connected. They are inseparable, in other words. 
So what kind of a person is a good person, by the way? A good person is not, you know, so-called yes man to everything. That's not a good person. Good person from the Bible is this. When God made the first human being, Adam, Adam and Eve, what did he say? Very good. Why? Because he created the first man in his image. That should be the definition of being good. So good person is someone who reflects the very image of the Lord. So what changes will occur when you are filled with the Holy Spirit? You become more like Jesus Christ. The first thing you notice is that you become very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. The will of the Holy Spirit and your will become almost identical. Your will and God's will, your thoughts and God's thoughts. Becoming identical, almost. We're not perfect. We're still kind of, you know, um, we have a sinfulness deep inside. So, may not be perfect, but you become more like Jesus by the help of the Holy Spirit. And that's a good person. Therefore, a person filled with the Holy Spirit is a person whose thoughts are primarily aligned with God, his thoughts. And if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you cannot help but be a good person, therefore. But sometimes you come across the people who may appear filled with the Holy Spirit when they are not. I don't know if you've come across those people, but... In other words, you know, some people only look like they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And being filled with the Holy Spirit does not, you know, depend on how many spiritual gifts you have. Or, you know, uh, simply because you've experienced some signs and wonders manifested by the Holy Spirit doesn't mean necessarily you are filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, you could experience the Holy Spirit all you want in the past, but that does not guarantee that you are being filled with the Holy Spirit today. That's what I mean. We must understand that the Holy Spirit is not in the business of revealing Himself, but revealing and highlighting Jesus Christ. That's the fact from the Bible. You don't boast around your spiritual gifts. You don't just, you know, boast around your spiritual experiences, no matter how that was the signs and wonders and miraculous. You don't reveal that, but if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, chances are you are going to reveal Jesus Christ in your life. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Likewise, there should be no misunderstanding about being filled with the faith. When we see a person who is kind of passionate about God, who is passionate about ministry, we just assume that this person is filled with the faith. And oftentimes, that's the case. Yes, there's a correlationship right there. However, we cannot simply assume or presume That all that passion is coming from the Lord. You don't assume that. Because some people, by nature, they're just passionate for everything. And some people, their, you know, just temperament, their personality is, you know, just very kind of shy and, you know, very introvert. So you don't assume that simply because, you know, this person is passionate serving this church, Therefore, this person is filled with the faith. There are many cases that they don't match together. This faith is not coming from the Lord, but just from yourself. That happens, and that happened to Peter. Think about Peter. Case with the Peter. You know, he said like he would die for Jesus. He was so sure about his faith. He was very passionate, enthusiastic, following Jesus Christ. And one day he goes, I could die for you, Jesus. But what happened? You know the rest of the story. He denied Jesus three times. 
Uh, when I served the church in Binghamton, New York, there was a young deacon who was uh, relatively new to the church, and he really uh, had a passion to serve this church. And one day, he texted me, and he goes, Pastor Song, I could die for Jesus. For me, that was a red flag. <laughs> okay? That was a red flag. Yeah. Not that I, you know, uh, discounted his willingness and his, his desire and passions, but since I know what happened to Peter, we have to be very cautious and careful. When we say that we could even die for Jesus, we have to be very humble about who we are and what we could do for the Lord. So going back to the story of Peter, he failed three times, and then after Jesus rose again, Jesus asked the question, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times. And then he goes, instead of saying with confidence, this time around he's, is, uh, you know, he kind of answered with a worry. You know, he goes, Lord, you know that I love you. The attitude, the attitude changed from I know my faith well to the Lord, you know my faith. That's the sign of a maturity. That's the sign that the Holy Spirit has been working through someone's lives. The faith is not believing what you want to believe without doubt. Make no mistakes. Faith is complete trust in God's love and grace. Faith is believing in the goodness and faithfulness of God and relying on Him without wavering, no matter what kind of situations that you may face. That's a real genuine faith. Barnabas was not a man who loved to reveal himself. He was a man who took the lead in encouraging and edifying others. He's the one who helped Paul to become a leader of leaders. He went to Tarsus to look for Paul and offered him to work together as a team ministry. At the time, everyone in Jerusalem was kind of suspicious of this guy Paul, since he was the man who persecuted Christians the most. So, even after his conversion, Seems like Paul was not trusted by other apostles or church leaders. But Barnabas was pretty different. He was able to see the potential from Paul. Barnabas connected Paul with other apostles, therefore. So Paul became a partner with all the church leaders, finally. Paul was a hard worker, and perhaps you know, his way of sharing the gospel was a little bit aggressive, so that, you know, he was threatened by Jews. That was his first ministry. Now, he was in, the way of, in his way of Damascus to persecute Christians, but on his way of Damascus, he was exposed to this light brighter than sun, and he heard a voice coming from Jesus, Saul, Saul, why have you persecuted me? We know this awesome testimony of Apostle Paul, and he just changed 180 degrees from that time on. So instead of persecuting Christians in Damascus, he shared the gospel in the city of Damascus. But like I said, you know, maybe it was a little bit, a little bit aggressive or, you know, maybe he was too passionate. Ended up that, you know, he kind of had to run away from the city at night. He fled to his hometown, Tarsus. That's what happened. That was his first ministry. Ever since then, 10 years passed. And the Bible does not tell us what happened in those years. We don't see the sign of a revival in the city of Tarsus. Although Paul was there, and I'm sure that Paul tried to share the gospel with you know, all that hometown people. But almost nothing happened for that 10 years. So we don't see any evidence of a revival in that city in that time period. Ten years disappeared. And I'm sure that a lot of church leaders, they might have forgotten about this guy, Paul. He was not one of the disciples anyway. 
He claimed to become a Christian. He claimed to have this awesome experience and so on. But look at the fruit. Nothing happened. So people might have forgotten this guy's name, Paul. However, Barnabas remembered him. So he reached out to him in Tarsus. And he offered a partnership for the ministry of the gospel in the church of Antioch. That's what happened. You know, for your information, Barnabas, his real name is Joseph. So Barnabas is not the real name. It's a more of a nickname. It means the son of comfort and encouragement. The reason why Apostle Paul making a big mark in history of Christianity was because he had a co-worker like Barnabas. God's servants do not grow overnight. It takes time. And God's servant does not work like a lone ranger. It doesn't work that way. We are all connected as a part of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ. So we must be able to work together and cooperate. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's move on to the final point. Third point is, Antioch Church is a church that was sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit and obeyed His will. In Acts chapter 13, in verse 2, we find that the Antioch Church was trying to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit while they were praying and fasting. They were serious about finding out God's will, what was going on there. They probably sensed that God wants to send those two guys, Barnabas and Paul, to the mission field. So they wanted to make sure that it is really coming from the Lord. So they prayed and prayed and they fasted to just discern the will of the Lord. They were very sensitive to the voice of God. If you develop a love relationship with Him, you cannot miss His will and His voice. I'm not talking about just an audible voice, but God still speaks today. Amen? Amen? God is not a dumb. He speaks through different ways. And know that, you know, every Wednesday you study this book, Experiencing God, right? God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the words, through prayer, through the body of Christ, the church, and also through the circumstances. Amen. You're not there yet? Okay, <laughs> we studied this from the experience in God, right? God still speaks through the Holy Spirit. So if you develop a loving relationship with God with a humble and pure heart, you will become sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The key to the, the hearing the voice of God is not some sort of techniques or formula, so to speak but an intimate love relationship with Him. Just as the Good Shepherd knows the voice of His sheep, the sheep also knows the shepherd's voice. That's how it works. The church that is pleasing to God listens to His voice to discern what His good and pleasing will is and obeys accordingly. If you are reluctant to obey, for example... What good is it to hear the voice of God? I mean, hearing the voice of God could be very mysterious, and it may just pump you up spiritually. You may be spiritually hyped up. But if you are not willing to that voice, what good is it to hear His voice in the first place? So if you are reluctant to obey, no matter how many times you listen to the voice of God, it is almost meaningless almost meaningless. No matter how much you read and study the Bible, the same token, 
No matter how much you know the Bible and study the Bible, memorize verses and so on, without an intention of obedience, it's almost nothing. You gain some knowledge of the Bible. You get some information about God. But that's as far as you can go. If you do not have any intention to obey His will, the Bible study it will just increase your knowledge, your head knowledge. And oftentimes that brings you to be a prideful. That leads you to be prideful. You think you know about God. You think you know about the Bible. You're like, I've been there, done that attitude. Very toxic. So you have to be very careful. When you study the Bible, when you listen to the message, whether you just listen to the message from here or from YouTube, make sure that your attitude, your heart is right with the Lord. Amen. Otherwise, it's not going to do good, but do harm. It's more harm than good. The Antioch church was a church that was not only sensitive to the voice of the Lord, but very obedient. They're like, Jesus, speak to us, and we're going to go all out for you, Jesus. Whatever you say, we're down. Lord, just speak to us. So they listened to the voice of the Lord, and guess what? Sure enough, God says, set apart these two guys, two boys, Barnabas and Paul, and I'm going to send them to the mission field. Can you imagine, you know, hearing the voice like that? I mean, this church has been booming, growing. They just started like a two or three years ago, and then it's about to just take off. It's about to fly, but then God goes, mm -mm, wait a minute, not so fast. You have to send these two great, amazing leaders to somewhere, somewhere else. That was the voice of the Lord. In a worldly perspective, from a worldly perspective, it's a pretty bad decision if the church sent them out as a missionaries. Because we are taking a risk that this local church may just go down in every way, you know, spiritual level, maturity, or number wise, and financial, you know, in every way they're taking a risk. Because they know that, you know, their growth, the church growth, was because of these two great servants of the Lord, like Barnabas and Paul, and their dedication, their prayer, and their preaching. But God goes, no, my plan is a little different from yours. Send them out. Send them out. And amazing thing about this church is that they obeyed. They obeyed to the command. How in the world was it possible? They completely trusted that the head of the church was not Paul, not Barnabas, but Jesus Christ. They understood that they just not only agreed with that, you know, the doctrines of the church, Ecclesia, but they truly believed in that. So they put them into practice. Yes, Lord, whatever you say, it's your church. So they sent them out to the mission field. And what was the aftermath? What happened? As a result, this Antioch church, they became a mission hub, just reaching out to Asia Minor and Europe, all over the world. They spread the gospel. And the reason why all the churches were able to praise the Lord and believe in God was through the simple obedience of the Antioch church. Behind of sin, yes, God was working through them. It was by God's grace. We know for sure, but without obedience, it wouldn't happen just like that. Through that obedience, God was able to father his kingdom, spreading the gospel. 
So just let me wrap up my message for today. Our church has been the light and salt in our community. God's grace for the past 48 years, uh, it's amazing. Amazing grace. I know that, you know, we had ups and downs. We had some trials and tribulations. But through that, I'm sure that, you know, all that non-essential things in the church melted away so that we could focus on the core of the gospel. That's the process of, you know, pruning process, right? We need that. But it's time to move on, though. We don't dwell in the past. Through good times, bad times, we become more mature. Through all that process, for the last 48 years, I'm sure that a lot of things probably happened in the past. But what matters is that we are here to continue to serve the Lord and reach out to this neighborhood with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Reaching out to the world. That is our mission. So let's keep focusing on the gospel as we set aside non-essential matters. Let us keep praying for the church that we may have more servants like Barnabas. Full of the Spirit. Full of faith. And also good reputation. We need a good reputation. Because I know that sometimes we hurt people because of our passions. We want to just be diligent and, you know, we want to be passionate serving, the, serving this church here and there. But by doing so, sometimes we stumble others. So I really pray, I hope and pray that we become more mature in our character so that we could bring more people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? May the Lord continue to bless our TFBC until He comes. Amen. Amen. Let's all arise. We're going to sing this hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken.
take this time to pray for our church. Uh, I think we're privileged to serve the body of Christ here. Um, and over the years, the past 48 years, uh, there must have been a lot of incidents, good things, bad things. And yet, one thing for sure is that God has been so faithful. People come and go. Pastors come and go. But Jesus never leaves us. He stays here as the head of the church. So let us just fix our eyes upon Jesus and continue to just pray that the Lord will use us to reach out this community. We want to be used by the Lord for the rest of our lives. That's our privilege. We're honored to be called the Christians. So let's take this time to just cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, until you come, until you come. God, we want to just carry out our missions here. We want to do the ministry of the gospel. Saving souls and raising leaders and discipling the disciples of Jesus. That's what we are here for. So Lord, be with us and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let's take this time to cry out to the Lord and pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Once again, Lord, this is our privilege. We are so honored to serve you through this local church. faithfulness. This morning we stand before you knowing that we are not worthy of being used and yet you came to us, you called us out of darkness and that we could serve you as the light and salt of this world. What an honor. What a privilege we have. So we lift up this time to you and asking Your special blessings upon all your servants. Strengthen us. Empower us. That we could serve you tirelessly. We thank you for all the leaders of this church. Including all our ordained deacons, appointed deacons. And the people who serve you without having any kind of recognitions or titles. It's all for you, Jesus. We're doing this for you, Jesus. So God, be with us and be glorified and be magnified through all that we do here until you come. May the grace of Jesus Christ and the abundant love of God Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.